If you would, and you remember how it feels when somebody makes you feel wonderful and welcome, stand up and do that to somebody. <laughs> Do you know where your children are? This morning, where some of you are sitting, it's almost like it's 9 o'clock. Does your husband know where you're sitting? Because I saw Sheila sitting over here. She never sits there. Katie's sitting here in the second pew. And uh, you're just kind of rearranged and shaking each other. Doug and Lori used to always sit over here. They're sitting over here in the middle from now on, which is wonderful, by the way. But you have to just kind of readjust. What? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I do ask that you take a moment to fill out the welcome blue card and let us know that you're here and any prayer needs that you might have. Uh, last evening, the men's ministry sponsored the Wiener Roast over at the Wiley's, a good time. Ladies, coming up in December the 10th is the Christmas brunch here at the church building. After the first of the year, sometime mid-January, our guys are going to have a wild game night. No, it's not. It's game that you eat, not game that you play. So uh, some neat events for our church family. Blood, we're taking that in two weeks. So uh, if you can contribute in this, Lydia would be glad to have you sign up. We're in Hebrews in chapter 4 this morning. Hebrews in chapter 4. Uh, before we look at the text, just a reminder, several of our folk are in the hospital. Uh, Don Lee uh, is recovering of all things, from an infection that got into a hair follicle in the back of the neck, and he's been there for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and today. And uh, remember him, Brother Dave Kelly is recovering from some complications related to back surgery. Uh, other folk are recovering. Tommy Johnson had his knee replaced this past week. They threw Bob Woodley out of Lake Taylor <laughs> Rehab Center. Not literally, but he is home, and Brenda's recovering. Charles Grove is over at Maryview as well. So uh, we'll make note of that in the bulletin. You're asking your Sunday school class uh, to be aware of those dear folk. Let's pray. Uh, Father, uh, thank you for the blessing of this day. Thank you for the transformation from summer to fall and the glory of these days, crisp evenings. Um, coffee does taste so much better these days than summer days. Thank you, Father. We're grateful for appropriate clothing and warm homes. Thank you for our employment. Thank you for the joy of being in our country. And thank you for the privilege of coming before you through Jesus Christ and the power and prompting of the Holy Spirit. We ask God that you bless our folk who have been hospitalized, Brother Dave Kelly and Charles Grove, uh, Don Lee, our folk who are recovering, uh, Tommy and Brenda and Bob. Lord, our precious sister, uh, Patty Birnott, in her ongoing uh, battle with cancer, may you pour out grace and peace, O oh God, and we appeal to you as the Lord who can heal to restore. So we thank you. Bless us now as we meet you in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, died in 1963, but he left behind just a wealth of books that have blessed Christians through the years. The most famous series is the Chronicles of Narnia that are being made into movies. But one of his more, more difficult works is entitled simply The Screwtape Letters. It's not an easy read, but it's a series of letters, fictitious of course, between a ranking demon by the name of Screwtape with his nephew who is also a demon by the name of Wormwood. And Wormwood has been assigned a project, a human being in England during World War II as the bombs are falling on London. His first responsibility is to keep this human project from becoming a Christian. Well, the man does become a Christian. So the second project is, how can you pry him away from God the Father's house and put him in our father, the devil's house? And so that's the intent of Wormwood, and the letters fly back and forth. In frustration, Wormwood says, maybe it would be best if he died during the war. And uh, Screwtape says, no. Man's greatest enemy, note this, he says, man's greatest enemy is not death. The Christian's greatest enemy is life. And here is the reasoning of that demon. 
He writes, if your man dies now, you lose him. If he survives the war, there is always hope, the hope that the man can be returned to the devil. But if he can be kept alive, you have life itself for your ally. The long, dull, monotonous years of middle-aged prosperity or middle-aged adversity are excellent campaigning weather. You see, it is so hard for these creatures to persevere. He's right on. Even though he's a lion demon, he's right on. How many folk, don't raise your hand, have started to diet but did not succeed? How many of you former smokers or present smokers have tried to stop and you're doing it again for the umpteenth time? How many times have you said, I'm going to keep this resolution from uh, New Year's Day that I will read my Bible on a daily basis and quit in Leviticus when you got there in March? Okay, perseverance does not become us. We easily give in, yet God prizes perseverance, endurance, faithfulness, steadfastness, sticking to the task until the task is done. Do you remember how many years Abraham and Sarah waited before Isaac was born to them? Take a stab. 25 years. 20, 75 when they come into the promised land. He's 100 years old when finally Isaac was born. Do you recall how many years did Moses serve as a shepherd in the Arabian Peninsula? Forty years. Then how many years did he lead Israel toward the promised land? Forty years. You know, next month Pat and I are going to get on a plane at 7 o'clock in the morning from Newport News, and we're going to be in Dallas, Texas by 11 o'clock that morning. All right, we know that you can travel a whole lot further from Egypt to Israel faster than 40 years. There's a matter of perseverance or endurance. Through our acquaintance with uh, Roanoke Bible College and Mid-Atlantic Christian University through the years, we've come into contact with a couple, Marvin and Dorothy Rose, who have been married for 70 years. 70 years. You know, in the book of Genesis, God had said to Abraham, I'm going to give your descendants this land, but it's going to take 430 years. And you read in the book of Exodus, the night of the Passover was 430 years to the day that God had made that promise. He prizes endurance and patience. How many years roughly from Malachi until the appearance of John the Baptist preaching the, the good news of the kingdom? 400 years, a little more than 400 years. God prizes endurance. William Wilberforce, who is an esteemed believer of the 19th century in England, for 26 years in the halls of parliament, he submitted a bill that would banish the slave trade from England. Every year for 26 years. And finally, in 1807... The Slave Trade Act was passed, and no longer could there be the trading in slaves, but there was still slavery. For 26 more years, even after his retirement from Parliament, he continued to petition for the abolition of all slavery. And in 1833, three days, after, three days before his death, that Slave Abolition Act was passed. You see, God treasures endurance and perseverance. And that is what is at the heart of the letter of Hebrews. Paul is calling his readers and calling us to endure, to be faithful, to be steadfast, to remain loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ until the end. And there are multiple pictures of Jesus, but there are three we're going to look at today. The first is, he says, how are we going to persevere? The first is by fixing our eyes on Jesus because he is our help in temptation. And then he's going to say, how can we persevere and endure? He's going to say, because Jesus is our high priest. And then the 12th chapter, he's going to say, how can we persevere and endure because we fix our eyes on Jesus who is like a faithful runner. You see, at the heart of Hebrews is perseverance because you and I have given our attention wholly to Jesus. It begins in the first chapter when Paul says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times in various ways. 
But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, who sustains all things by his powerful word. And then he says, after he had made purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven. Fix your eyes on Jesus and you will persevere. That's Hebrews. In chapter 4, we're going to read chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. And Paul's going to say, fix your eyes on Jesus because he will help you in temptation. Let's read it together. Verse 14 down through verse 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, this text follows a stern warning. Paul, in chapters 3 and 4, had said to his readers, who are primarily Jewish, you remember what happened to our forefathers when they left Egypt. They eventually fell away from God. You remember that after they crossed through the Red Sea, immediately they begin to complain about what? We have no food. We're going to starve to death. And so God provided manna for them, not just one day, but apparently every day for the next 40 years, excepting the Sabbath days. And he provided a double supply on that Friday before the Sabbath. Soon afterwards, they're complaining about, we have no water. We're going to thirst to death. You just brought us out here so that we would die, dried up bodies in the desert. And then they said, we have no meat. We had melons and onions and fish back in Egypt, and you brought us out here and deprived us of meat. They are repeatedly rebelling against God. And Paul in chapters 3 and 4 gives two warnings. He says, number one, you need to be careful with sin because sin will harden your heart to God. You know, we know this relationally. If you sin against a person, you lie about a person, don't repent of it, your heart will be hardened toward the person that you lied about. And you find it easier to lie to someone else. Sin will harden the heart. And so Paul says, encourage each other so that sin won't harden your heart. The other warning is, Israel chose to disbelieve and disobey God. And he warns them, please don't be like them. You remember how old... This is the book of Numbers chapter 14. They refused to go into the promised land. And God said, because you refuse to go into the promised land, all of you who are older than what age will never enter it? 20. Can you imagine how many Israelites were older than 20, but because of unbelief, they were not permitted to enter the land of promise? There were only two men who were above that age who were allowed to enter. Who were they? Joshua and Caleb. Why? Because they were faithful to God. And that's in chapters 3 and 4 leading up to this passage. And now Paul says to us, Therefore, since we have a high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. In other words, hold firmly to Jesus Christ. Now, when men shake hands with men, what are you looking for in a man's handshake, Bob? Firmness. Yes. Now, you don't shake a woman's hand that way, especially arthritic women. Not as true, you know, dear Ann Lassiter. You remember those of us who knew and loved her for all those years, knew how twisted arthritis had made her hand so when you shook her hand, it needed to be gentle. And there are some people who have arthritic hands today, and so you're gentle in handling that. But I can just tell you, if you're a guy and you've got a fish for a handshake, the other guy remembers it. <laughs> He doesn't think you're weird or something. He just said, that's a weak handshake. In the same way, when you shake hands with a woman, a guy with a woman, she's got a firm handshake, you remember that. That's a picture. Paul says, get a firm handshake on Jesus Christ. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Jesus, 
the Son of the living God who gave His life for us, who arose again and who has saved us by His death and resurrection. In Jesus Christ, we've been adopted as God's sons and daughters. In Jesus Christ, we have become priests under the living God. In Jesus Christ, we have become heirs of the kingdom of God. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. And then Paul says, well, why should we do that in the face of temptation? And he tells us, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. And you think of some of the temptations that are recorded in Scripture. There is the early one that Matthew, Mark, and Luke record of Jesus fasting for 40 days, and then the three temptations, the bread, the temple pinnacle, and then the kingdoms of the world. But you read in a good translation from Mark's gospel in chapter 1, Mark suggests that Jesus was tempted throughout those entire 40 days. And we simply have a sampling of what the Lord endured during those 40 days. Then in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, Jesus said, I'm going to be handed over to the Jewish leaders. I'm going to suffer and be put to death and rise in the third day. Peter's response was, perish the thought. This cannot happen to you. Jesus says, get thee behind me. Give you a choice, Peter or Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. From his most intimate friend, he was being approached by the evil one and tempted. Then in John's Gospel in chapter 6, Jesus had fed 5,000 men plus women and children, five loaves of bread, two fish. After he had done that, what did the people want to do with Jesus? Yes, they wanted more, and they made, wanted to make him their king. You see, that was the fulfillment of what the devil had tempted him with earlier. The evil one had said, bow down and worship me, you'll become a king right away. They said, you can become a king without suffering, just give us more bread. And at the end of chapter 6, Jesus identified obliquely, yes, when he says, you're following me and one of you has a devil, referring to Judas. He knew from that point on, obviously, who his betrayer was going to be. How much earlier, we do not know, but we do know at that point. Think for a moment that I know Pat is an adulteress. And we live in the same house for the next two years and never say, are you an adulteress? Or I'm an adulterer and we live together during that time and I think it's done secretly and she doesn't know anything, but she does know what would her attitude be toward me. Or you've got a son or a daughter who is robbing you blind. Every day when you come in with your purse or your wallet and you put it down, your child is robbing money from you, and yet for your own reasons you choose to do nothing. How do you live in a house with a thief? And yet Jesus bore with Judas until the end, even washing his feet. So that when Paul says here, he was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin, that is utterly astounding. Isn't it? Because you and I have spoken when we should have shut up at times, right? And there are times we were silent when we should have spoken. We know that we have played with words in order to deceive. It may have not been a blank lie, but it was deceit. Nevertheless, we have sat in front of a television program knowing we should have clicked to something else or walked out of a movie house and refused to do so. We know that under pressure we've broken. But Jesus Christ, He was tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. I appreciate it. when Pete mentioned this past week, he said, I like beautiful women. Jesus did too. Jesus did too. But you know... Jesus never looked at a woman with disrespect. He never touched a woman with disrespect. And he never uh, spoke of a woman with disrespect. I find that utterly astounding. And the application that Paul makes is, therefore let us approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Note that we approach a throne not of fear or power or authority, though all that is true, but it is the throne of 
grace that we draw near. And what do we find there? He says we find mercy. You think of people who drew near to Jesus looking for mercy. The woman at the well in John chapter 4, five times married, now living with a man. What does she find from Jesus? Mercy. The Canaanite woman who comes to Jesus and begs that he deliver her daughter from a demon. And there's this interesting conversation between the two. But what she receives is mercy. A leper who has no business coming into the presence of Jesus says, If you will, you can heal me. And Jesus touches him. He gives him mercy. I want you to know when the Bible says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, it means it. He is the same merciful Savior and Lord. And He is able to help us. Why? Because He's been tempted in every way, yet was without sin. Every temptation? Yes. Our need, beloved, is to learn the art of living in the presence of Jesus. We have a beautiful example of this, the Old Testament. In David, the age of a late teen, no doubt, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, when he takes on Goliath, an astounding conflict. Goliath is nine and a half feet tall. He is a trained warrior. He's walking around with a spear that has its spearhead, weighs almost as much as a modern shot put. A modern shot put weighs 16 pounds. The best athletes in the world can barely get beyond 70, 71, 72 feet. He's walking around with a spear that weighs its spear point, 15 pounds. And yet David comes before him and says, I come in the name of the living God. You've blasphemed God's armies and defied him long enough. He will give you into my hands. And David got the victory. But that's not the truth. The truth is God gave David the victory. And David knew it. It's the same way with us. We may be tempted with fear. You know, we took away the buckets. I don't know what you, if you were here Wednesday evening and, and Pete had us uh, tossed into that bucket. What is an area with which you struggle and battle and that you would love just to toss away to the Lord? Mine was fear. I don't know what yours might have been. Mine was fear. I know that when I walk in the presence of Christ, I have nothing to fear. But when I forget, then fear intrudes. For you, it may be a struggle quite common to many men. Pete said, raise your hand, men, if you've never lusted. And all of us from here over, hands down. A couple little guys over here in the kids' section said, what's lust? And Pete said, yeah, they didn't even understand it. And two little hands peeked up over here without any understanding of what that battle entails. Then he said, anyone here who's never lied, please raise your hand. Not a hand was raised. Why? Because we know the battle with temptation and failure. Is Jesus sufficient to make me an honest man? Is he adequate to give me a pure heart? Is he sufficient to break an addiction? Paul says... Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. If you and I are ever going to persevere, it will not be because we are strong or bright or beautiful, but because we fix our eyes on Jesus, who is our help in temptation. Then look, if you would, at chapter 7, just quickly. The second image that Paul borrows, and it's taken from the Old Testament, and we're going to be reading in just a moment, verse 23 and following, if you look there. But this is in the midst of a section where Paul says that Jesus is our high priest. And he goes back to the Old Testament and he reminds us of this interesting character from the Old Testament, Melchizedek. He's mentioned only two passages in the Bible, three, two in the Old Testament, Genesis 14, Psalm 110, and then several times here in the middle of Hebrews. But Paul says Melchizedek is a picture of what Jesus is perfectly. And he says, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And he's the king of Salem. That means he is the king of peace. And Paul says he is king of righteousness and king of peace on the basis of an indestructible life based upon the promise of God. Now think of this for a moment. King of righteousness. Paul's already told us in chapter 4, Jesus was tempted in every way just as we are yet was without sin. Amazing. He really is the king of righteousness. Whenever Jesus opened his mouth, the truth came out. 
Whenever Jesus looked at a person or touched an individual or performed a miracle or some kindness, he was demonstrating his righteousness. But he's not simply a king who is righteous. He is a king who makes us righteous. You know, you and I are not righteous because we're here today in the sense of because of something that we've done. It's not, we're not righteous because we met at the Lord's table, because we prayed, because we sang just a fantastic worship service as usually occurs here at West Park. That's not what makes us righteous. But we are righteous because in Christ, in Christ alone. Isaiah chapter 61, there the prophet said, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me in garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. Stand up if you would. I'd love to pick on my wife because people say afterwards, stop doing that. Because I'm defiant at heart. Turn around. Turn around. Now, who, who dressed you in those clothes? Yes, you thought it was me, didn't you? You know better because I'm tight. Okay. Yeah. Alicia shows up at our house yesterday with this bundle of clothing and brings it in. Pat goes through and had to pick out several things. And she decided, I'm going to start wearing some pantsuits on Sunday mornings. I never do, but these things just look too good. You are delightful and beautiful. Please be seated, honey. Thank you for that. You know what? My wife paid squat for that. I didn't pay anything either. All that she can say is, thank you. And you know what? That's exactly our relationship to the living God. We are dressed in the righteousness of Christ as a gift from beginning to end. Several weeks ago, one of our folk who had returned to the church family commented. She said, you know, one time I heard you make a statement that you were the most despicable person that you knew. And I said, that's still true. And she said, dawned on me that I'm the most despicable person that I know. But the only person I know is despicable is me. And this past week, and just doing some walking in the neighborhood, and just thinking on that, the corollary to that truth is, not only am I the most despicable person that I know, the greater truth is, I am the most forgiven person that I know. The most forgiven one that I know. Why? Because he is my king of righteousness. Then he's the king of peace. The, the Hebrew behind this word shalom, which is not simply peace, the absence of war, it's total well-being. It's physical health, financial health, emotional health, spiritual health. It's health to the nth degree. And Paul says he is the king of peace. Now think of this. If a man intrudes my house and violates my wife, what would I do? I asked Bob McDonald that today. He said I'd kill him. I understand that. You know, Muammar Gaddafi getting it in the head in the desert appears to be appropriate after 42 years of tyranny. We understand that. And I know there's a legal process, probably wouldn't shoot the person, but he ought to be prosecuted, right? A man violates your daughter, your son. He has made himself your enemy. But that's exactly what we have done with respect to God by our lies and our gossip and our fornication and our addictions and our greed and our covetousness. We have made ourselves God's enemy. And God sends the King of Peace, Jesus, not to execute justice, but to make it possible for us to have peace between us and Him. The Bible word is reconciliation. He has made us his friends. He is king of righteousness, king of peace. And nobody else can do that. You know, some of us have availed ourselves of uh, psychological counseling. Do you know what? The counselor that you see wrestles with anxiety and worry. Maybe different than yours, but he's got the same bag of issues. Do you know what? Marriage counselors sometimes divorce. <gasps> he's supposed to help me. He's limited in what he can do. Do you know that counselors wrestle with addiction? And I'm going to clue you in. The doctor that you go through for your health, he's going to die. Doctors get the flu. Doctors get pneumonia. Some doctors battle with an addiction to nicotine. That's why you see the nurses hanging out in the back of Maryview Hospital still smoking, and some of the doctors do as well. 
You see, the people that we go to and say, fix me, fix me, are broken just as much as we are. Who can put us back together? Jesus, because he is king of righteousness and king of peace. This past Tuesday, walking by the 7-Eleven, you see a lot of the 7-Eleven. I looked down on the sidewalk and I saw, you'll recognize this action figure, the upper thigh was, it was only a leg, the upper thigh was blue and the bottom was a red webbed stocking. Spider-Man! Anything a spider can do, he can do. So I didn't retrieve him at that point, but I looked in the gutter and there was the remains of Spider-Man. And so Pat and I went back yesterday morning walking, wanted to see if there was anything left. This is what we found. Spidey's arm, Spidey's other arm, the bottom of one of his legs, and his head. Can he help anybody? Can you and I put anybody's life back together? The answer is no. We are as busted as Spider-Man. I know it's burst, not busted, burst. He's broken, and so are we. And Jesus Christ comes. He is the king of righteousness. He is the king of peace. He is so by virtue of the oath of God and an indestructible life. And we're just going to read a part of chapter 7 since I asked you to turn there. Look in chapter 7, verse 23. And we're going to read just down through verse 26. Chapter 23 of chapter 7. In the midst of this discussion of Jesus the high priest. Let's read it. 23 through 26. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. Because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners exalted above the heavens. Look at the beginning of verse 6, 26. Such a high priest meets our need. Nobody else. Nobody else. So Paul says, he will help us in temptation. Fix your eyes on him. He is the great high priest. Fix your eyes on him very quickly. Look at chapter 12 for a moment. In chapter 12, the imagery that's used of Jesus is he a, a faithful runner. And let's... Read chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 together, please. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Ready? Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now he says back in verse 1, he says, let's throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles. Some things that hinder us are not sinful. I heard uh, Dr. William Bennett, former Secretary of Education in the Reagan administration, he said statistically, young men who are in their 20s spend more time playing video games than teenage boys. Now, the best of my knowledge, video game is not a sin. But will it preoccupy a person and keep him from growing? I have no question of that. No question at all. All right? You know, there are some practices, some habits, some hobbies that we have that take us further and further away. To the best of my knowledge, NASCAR racing is not a sin. But it certainly has become a religion for a lot of people who have followed it. They know more about the death of Dale Earnhardt than they know about the cross. And I don't say it would be ugly. Jeff Gordon, I, 24, that's the one I follow, Okay. So there's no, I'm not saying it's a sin. I'm just saying there are a lot of things that can be obstruction. There are some friendships. Every time we are with certain people, we know certain conversations are going to erupt. They're going to be about other people. And though we may remain silent and even say, now, 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 don't say that. We know that the friendship itself is one that does not promote us in Christ, but rather takes us further from 
him. They are not wicked. You know, the worst time in my life is vacation. And why is that? Because suddenly my life is unstructured. I don't have a time to get up. I don't have a time to go to bed. I don't have a regular time to be sitting down meeting with the Lord. There are too many people around and too many people who are there and Pat's saying, why don't you sleep a little bit longer? Why don't you stay up a little bit longer? And it is for me spiritually one of the most dangerous periods. Is there anything wicked in a vacation? I hope not. But I do know that it can separate one from Christ if he is not careful. And then Paul says, get rid of any sin in your life. And there are times when we've been cautioned, Dean did at the Lord's table, when we deliberately speak what is false, engage in conversations that are hurtful and wrong, allow ourselves to be drawn into a program or a fascination, and it's clearly wrong. Paul says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. You know, Years ago in running in a 10K race, before I really trusted people to take care of my clothing, I ran 6.2 miles holding a dry t-shirt. Of course, it wasn't dry when I finished because my hand was sweaty the entire time. And I remember thinking one mile into this race, I hate this t-shirt. Why didn't I put it in the bag and let the people transport it to the finish line instead of your carrying it? No sin in a t-shirt. It simply became an obstruction for running. And in your own life before the Lord Jesus, you alone can answer that. You need to take a look at your viewing habits, use of evening time, the use of early morning time, and to say, Lord, are there areas where I simply need to back away and reload in a different direction altogether? Are there some activities that are clearly wrong that I would not... You know, I don't, I don't like the idea of being duct taped to anyone, but that was an interesting picture, wouldn't it? But if you were duct taped to me, I'd behave differently at home. Not because of me, but because of you. But Paul says, we are running here with the Lord Jesus Christ. I can tell you, as one who has run, it is the pitch to run alone. It is a joy to run with a partner. And Paul says to us, our partner in this race is the Lord Jesus Christ, who will never abandon or forsake he is with us when we rise. He is with us when we shower. He is with us when we eat. He's with us when we're driving. He is there by His Spirit during the course of our work day. He's at there at the end of the day when we're with our families. He's there with us when we rest in the evening. We never, never run alone. And Paul says, let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. How do we persevere? Paul says, you fix your eyes on Jesus, our help in temptation, our great high priest, and the faithful runner. If you're out at night in our area, cut down Ferry Road, if you would. Uh, one of Charles and Daryl Lynn's neighbors, just two doors down for them, their whole yard is filled with Halloween inflatables. And even if you think that all Halloween is wicked and vile, you ought to go by because even though they're ghoulish scenes, it's light and it's orange, and I don't think anybody's tempted by sin by looking at what they've got in their front yard. And so twice this past week in the evening, Pat and I have gone out for a walk. We deliberately walked by their home because it's light, it's seasonal, and it's pretty. But one day, in the daylight, we were driving by, and all the inflatables were deflated. And Pat said, just looks like trash in the yard, doesn't it? <laughs> and it does. But that's your life without the Spirit of God. You are a deflated inflatable. <laughs> there is a reason that you and I feel like trash in our sin. Because sin trashes everything that it touches. But when a person comes to embrace Jesus Christ, he fills us with two things, with life and with light. And he does it not just at night, he does it continuously through our lives. Even when there's no life within us, there is his life. And if in your walk with the Lord Jesus, you're a Christian, and you'd say, I'm not persevering. 
Paul's admonition and encouragement is, look to Jesus who will help you in temptation. He is a great high priest, king of righteousness, king of peace, who has an indestructible life. He's the one that you need, and he's a faithful runner, and he will never outrun you, and he will never lag behind you. He will never compete with you. He will never abandon you. If you've never received him, his invitation is simple. Peter gave it to folk to repent of their sins, to turn from sin to a new Lord and a new life. His name is Jesus. To express that faith and repentance by the joy of being baptized into him because he's faithful. And then you run. You know, the most exciting point of a race is when they fire the gun at the beginning. And I tell you, no matter if you're up at the front where I've never been, or you're back with a thousand people, there's a moment that the gun sounds and everybody moves. But there's no sweeter sight than the end of the race when you finish. And Jesus said, I'll make you persevere to the end. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the work that you do within us and for your remarkable patience. We ask, Lord God, that you'd help us to run with endurance and perseverance to the end. I pray for our whole church family, for those who know Jesus Christ, that you'd help us to develop, God, the art and discipline of knowing the presence of Christ with us continually. And for precious folk who don't know Jesus yet, May they not leave today and they, till they talk with one of us about beginning to follow Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Let's stand and sing.